please give a warm welcome to Professor Jörg Guido Hulsman. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this warm welcome indeed. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to talk to you uh, this afternoon. Uh, to be here in Krakow with the Polish Mises Institute. Uh, I must say that uh, it's always a pleasure to be at a birthday party. So this is the 15th birthday party. So this is uh, it's always a joyful occasion. And it reminds me of my very first trip to Krakow. Because I've been here in a year when some of the audience have not even been born. So I've been a Krakowian before you. Uh, in 1994, so this was a few years after the collapse of the, the Soviet system, I traveled with my girlfriend to, to Krakow. She's today my wife. And um, so we were visiting the, uh, the, the city. At the time, I had barely uh, started studying Austrian economics. Well, OK, it was a little bit more advanced than this, but I did not yet come across Austrian economics for a long time. Uh, I certainly had no idea that would, I would ever write a book on Ludwig von Mises. Uh, I had never heard of Matt Mackay. I could not imagine. Um, I, I think I, I barely knew that there was a, a Mises Institute in the United States. But certainly I could not imagine that something like this would ever uh, take place, that I would meet a wonderful person, uh, promising young intellectual like, like uh, Matt Mackay, and that something like this would happen. So this was probably all in God's plans, but it was not visible to anybody, not imaginable uh, for us here. So I'm, I'm very happy to see this group here. Uh, which is testimony for the interest that he has uh, managed to rouse in Austrian economics, and which Austrian economics uh, richly deserves. In 1994, I also noticed um, uh, that uh, Krakow had this wonderful uh, uh, central place in, in the town. There was this wonderful castle. So all these things I recognized when I returned them uh, to them now. Um, but all other things have greatly changed, right? So there are affluent neighborhoods now. There are Poles who have money, um, Poles who have very different faces today than in, in those days. Uh, this is something that, that younger people cannot imagine. It's, in a way, it's a pity that you have never seen this. But I can tell you, this was one of the most depressing aspects of, uh, of uh, real life socialism uh, in the 1980s and in the 1990s, the way I've, I've experienced it, that people were just so depressed. There was, there was no, no, no purpose to their life. There's, everything was just fixed from, from, from cradle to grave. And they were walking through the streets rather grim. Everything was gray. Often the faces were pale and so on. Not enough vitamins, I, I suppose. Uh, and all of this has changed. Right? So you have now these wonderful uh, streets, and uh, all the buildings are in good shape. Uh, people are having cars, and people have purposes in their lives. Right? And you see that they're, they're, they're driven. They have their own projects, and they can realize their own projects. So all of this is possible if you have a little liberty in life. Right? So it's wonderful to see this. My subject is uh, uh, Ludwig von Mises. Uh, little, little, uh, I will present a few ideas on, on uh, some aspect that appears to me to be particularly characteristic of Austrian economics in general and of Mises thought in, in, in particular, and which sets it apart from um, uh, the, the, the mainstream or usual or standard way, or however you want to call this, of uh, tackling these, these same issues. Uh, Mises is known very well as, as a, he's a famous theoretician, uh, economic theory. Uh, he has uh, about path-breaking works concerning the epistemologic, epistemology of, uh, of economics. And of course, he's famous as a champion of liberalism. The central piece of, uh, of liberalism, right, the, the, the starting point, the central agenda, if you wish, is sometimes called the non-aggression uh, theorem of a non-aggression principle, is nobody has the right to initiate uh, violence against other people. Nobody has the right to invade the, the sphere of, of other people. So this is all fine. But then we immediately, of course, in, uh, encounter the, um, the concept of property, of private property. Because if we say nobody has the right to initiate violence, what do we mean? If I recover something that somebody else has stolen from me, this is not violence, even if I slap the guy because he would not otherwise return my wallet to me if he has taken it away from me. Right? 
if I uh, keep people out of my living room because they somehow fancy that they have the, the right to free immigration into my living room, uh, then this is not a violence, it's not non-aggression. Right? So it's the other people who aggressed uh, me, so I have the right to repulse them. And uh, the, the, the decisive criterion for, for, for to, to make the distinction between um, the legitimate violence on the one hand, the illegitimate violence on the other hand is always property, uh, private property. Yesterday, private property. Tomorrow, private property, always. Now, um, what is important in the Austrian approach is the way it deals with property as a, a fundamental concept of economic analysis. This is something that is very clear in a writer such as Murray Rothbard. And it's something that is very irritating if you come from mainstream economics. My own case is, uh, is, a, is a case in point. When I first started reading Rothbard, Man, e Economy and State, you have uh, at the end of, uh, at the beginning of chapter two, you have a, a lengthy discussion of, uh, uh, of private property and of uh, regimes of appropriation, different ways you can set up rules for, trans, uh, for acquiring and transmitting property and so on. And I found this very irritating. When I asked myself, so what has this to do in a treatise on economics. Is this not just politics? Is this not just ideology? And so I put Rothbard back onto the bookshelves. It was, was just too much for me. I so said, no, I want to get economics. I, I don't want to get this kind of stuff. And it was only much later when I had more time to think through economics, when I had time to learn from, from Mises and so on, that I eventually came to appreciate Rothbard. And Rothbard was right. right. Private property is a starting point um, for economic analysis. It's an irreducible element, uh, a primitive of economic reasoning that we need and beyond which we cannot go. So, of course, it doesn't mean that in other disciplines that a philosopher might not have uh, to say more fundamental things about uh, private property and so on. But for an economist, it's a starting point that you can't, cannot uh, avoid. Now, in Mises, this is not explicit. Mises, in none of his writings, he has uh, uh, a chapter in which he explains this analytical role of, of property, uh, so which sets him apart from Rothbard, which sets him also apart from, uh, from Frédéric Bastiat. For example, in the 19th century, he was very explicit in underlining again and again the importance of, of property for not only political liberty, but also for economic reasoning. But Mises was led to highlight this role indirectly whenever, and on all those occasions, when he undertook to discuss concrete problems. And the most uh, uh, important point, uh, the most important occasion, the best known occasion, is of course his socialist calculation argument. The socialist calculation argument that he presented in, uh, in a talk in 1919 for the first time and then published in an article in 1920 and eventually elaborated in a more systematic treatise on socialism in 1922. Now what Mises did here is, is the following. So in his encounter with uh, the, the champions of uh, socialist uh, regimes, you know, this was 1919, so the immediate post-World War I period, um, socialism was in both intellectually and also as a social movement at its absolute high point. It never reached again uh, such a position of influence and the, the main reason is that until then, uh, there was no real life experience with socialist regimes. Right? So it was all theory. And in theory, uh, the socialists promised that by creating, by, by imposing on the economy a central uh, plan system, uh, we could get rid of the anarchy of the market, the anarchy of production. So the enormous waste that would take place in the market economy could henceforth be um, avoided. And moreover, all the, the, the working classes would be liberated from uh, exploitation of their capitalist masters. Also in this context, so then uh, one of the countries in which there was an attempt to introduce a socialist system was Austria, so Mises um, is his own country, and Mises was therefore involved in debates with uh, uh, his former fellow students who now had come to uh, be ministers and prime ministers and, and so on in Austria were about to, to introduce this in Austria. So he presented this argument. The argument is that, um, as most of you probably know, that um, it is not possible to 
uh, organize a socialist uh, system. It's not possible to create something like a central plan for the entire economy because um, in order to assess the economic significance of uh, economic goods that are removed from day-to-day -day experience, we need to have market prices. So if we, in, in a market economy, this is, is, not, this is something that goes uh, by itself, right? We, um, we are used to uh, be able to compare different invest, uh, uh, production processes uh, not only in terms of our personal values, but also in terms of the profitability that they generate. Right? So if, let's say, if I have the possibility to produce uh, milk and I have the possibility to produce a musical concert or I have the possibility to pro produce whatever, a very uh, complicated little uh, uh, machine that I use for the production of another machine that I produce for the uh, production of a uh, uh, production belt, uh, which will eventually give me a computer screen then I can use always the same tool. What I do is to look at the prices of the product, the prices of the factor of production that I need, and thanks to the market prices, I can compare my input to my output. I can, can compare the, uh, the value that I uh, destroy in the production process to the value that I create, and therefore see, well, do I produce additional revenue or do I destroy revenue, do I destroy capital? And uh, secondly, I can perform a second comparison by comparing the uh, profit rates of the different investment projects. I can say, well, the production of the machine costs me, or will, will generate 15%, the production of the uh, concert, concerto will pr pr uh, produce 8%, and the production of the, the milk will create 25%. So I com compare um, activities that, from a physical point of view, are completely heterogeneous, I can compare them in terms of a common unit. So this goes by themselves. And Mises uh, says that, well, as, uh, in, in a socialist regime, we can no longer do this because we don't have market prices. We don't, especially, we don't have market prices for factors of production. And so we can still compare and make our own minds up about the relative importance of consumer goods of milk and concertos and so on, right? We reach some political consensus and so on. We say that as a society, we want to have more milk rather than more concertos or the other way around. But we cannot assess the importance of factors of production that are very much removed from our immediate field of experience to the things that we do have immediate experience of. And in a developed economy based on the division of labor, most of the stuff that we are producing is removed from the immediate experience that we have of things as, as consumers. So most of the stuff, uh, we would be completely at a loss to assess their relative importance as compared to the importance of stuff that we know about if we didn't have the information coming from market prices. As soon as you introduce a socialist uh, system, then by definition you get rid of market prices because market prices presuppose private property rights. Right? I can uh, have a market price only through exchange and the exchange presupposes different owners. So if there's only one owner in a socialist regime, then there can be no prices, at least no prices for factors of production. So far, so good. And so this was a very powerful argument. And Mises, at the beginning, did not quite see the implications of, uh, of this argument and he would refine it in, uh, in the course of the next uh, few decades. There's one point in particular that he would uh, stress in later writings more at the very beginning, namely that the economic laws and the economic phenomena that we take for granted in, by our experience with the market economy, the ability to perform economic calculation, distinctions such as capital, uh, the distinction between revenue and, in, and investment, uh, and so on, um, makes sense only in uh, such an economy and are therefore historically contingent. Okay. So there are economic laws, the laws of the market economy, which are universal. They hold for all market economies at all times and in all places. Not only are they universal, they are a priori laws, as Mises would eventually argue. And so we can know them even if we do not know the particular circumstances of time and place that prevail in this and that economy. There are certain things that we can know a priori. 
in any exchange, right, each person always expects to receive a value that is higher than the value that he abandons. This is a universal feature of any exchange. It doesn't hold true only for uh, Krakow 2018. It also holds true for Germany 1920 and for France 2017. Okay. So there are these universal laws, but these universal laws are historically contingent. They depend on the prevalence of certain conditions that themselves are contingent. Now that's an, an interesting construction. Right? And it leads us to understand the foundational role of, uh, of private property. There are certain phenomena that come into existence only once we have a private property regime and which would be inexistent if these conditions are not given. Mises was therefore uh, led to, um, to come to conclusions that were radically at odds with the ones uh, prevailing in classical economics, but also in Marxism, and within the other branches of the, the Austrian school. With, uh, this is, yeah, all other Austrian economists. Let me say a few words about this. Um, I will compare Mises, briefly to, Mises' position briefly to the one of John Stuart Mill, uh, to the one of Marxism, and uh, the one of uh, Friedrich von Wieser. So according to John Stuart Mill, uh, the economic theory of, uh, of the market pertained only to the conditions of the distribution of wealth. It did not have anything to do, in particular, with the production of wealth. Production of wealth was a completely technological matter. Economists did have, didn't have anything in particular to say about production. All they, they said was concerned the exchange of goods and thereby the, the distribution of economic goods once they were being produced. Now clearly what uh, Mises' position implied is, 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 it's, uh, is that Exchange is fundamental for production itself. If you do not have exchange, that is, if you do not have private property, you have no exchange, you have no market prices, then it's impossible to assess goods, the economic significance of goods that are removed from immediate consumer goods uh, decisions. So as a consequence, you are unable to put into place what uh, Ben Barbeck would call roundabout schemes for production. That is, you are unable to, what in, in today's um, uh, jargon in, um, uh, in, uh, in, in management science, it would, call, it would be called a, a value chain. Right? You are unable to create very long and complex value chains. You are unable to, to put, put into place a division of labor between people who are involved in creating goods very far, uh, completely removed from our day-to-day -day experience as consumers. So therefore, without uh, the market, you cannot go very far in building a division of labor. Right? It has a fundamental impact on production. It's not just a theory of distribution, it's a theory of production, fundamentally. Now this was quite similar to the, uh, or so it seemed, to the position that has been exposed by uh, Mises' Austrian predecessors, by um, uh, Menger and Ben Barwerk and Visa in particular. But what emerged, uh, the, the, the prevalent view among these Austrian forebears, which is most clearly articulated in the works of Friedrich von Wieser, is the idea that uh, the, the, um, uh, the laws of value, as he called it, are universal values that hold true under all times and places. Wieser adopted the opposite, uh, uh, opposed the million position by saying, well, actually, Economics does not have much to say about distribution because here political decisions uh, come into play and we might distribute uh, goods once they've been produced as we wish. So the market exchange is one possibility, but we can have uh, the welfare state and, and various other things. But e economics is particularly relevant when it comes to the production of goods because here we have, all of us, we have an interest in producing goods in the most efficient uh, way possible in order to do this, well, we need to take into account the relative value of all these goods. So what Visa argued, and here's the great difference as compared to Mises' position, is that ultimately you can have something like economic calculation in the form of the calculation of subjective value. 
Whereas Mises argues that subjective value is a different reality from market prices. Right? Because uh, subjective values are embodied in market prices, but if you don't have market prices, you just have subjective values you could not calculate. Right? A subjective value is just a, a relative importance of one thing as compared to another. It's not a quantitative thing. Right? It's not a quantitative uh, uh, phenomenon that you could measure and that you could compare to other things of the same kind. In fact, each um, value relationship, that is something is more important than another thing, is heterogeneous as compared to all other value relationships. Right now, I have, for example, the, the, the alternative of continuing my talk or just walking away. Right? I have this liberty, so I prefer continuing, to, and you have the same liberty as staying here. Uh, 10 minutes later, right, the, the alternative is a different one. Right? We can have whatever, this snack or this, this other. Right? That is, the values that come to play out in each concrete situation are always different. They are heteronomous. They cannot be compared to one another. We cannot add them up, subtract them uh, from, from one another, and so on. It's completely different things. It's only when we are exchanging that we can add up, subtract from, from one another, market prices, revenues, and so on, that result from the, the exchange. So therefore, Mises argues, well, we have these universal laws of value, Okay, but the universal laws of value, for example, the law of diminishing marginal value, right, this is a universal law of value, uh, uh, maybe the, 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 the law of time preference, right? Present goods are always of higher value than, than future goods. It's a universal law of, of value. But this does not allow us to calculate. What allows us to calculate is only market prices. And so that we have universal laws that pertain to market prices, but market prices do not exist under all conditions. They exist only there where we have private property and where we do exchange. Right. So Mises' position is distinctly different from the one that we find in Visa and distinctly distinct also from the one that we find in Bumbarwerk and, and Mises and Menga. So it was a huge step forward. And of course, it's very different also from the position that we find in Marxism. And Marxism and also similar, the position of the historical school is there are no economic laws whatsoever. And what econ economists fancy to be universals uh, are just more or less um, uh, uh, passing uh, relationships that can be observed here and there. Uh, the only thing that is truly universal, universal are the laws of the transformation of society. Right? A society is always transformed under the impact of productive forces, so ultimately production technology. And uh, these changes in production technology they always revolutionize, they, they always overhaul uh, uh, relationships of, of dominance, right? There's one group of uh, person always dominating another group of person under given technology because they are at the, the, the steering uh, wheel of, of, of the current technology. And as technology changes, well, this relationship can no longer be perpetuated, so it comes to a class conflict, and eventually we move on to the next step. And the final, uh, uh, end station of this process is uh, the, the classless uh, society in which there's no more uh, technological transformation at all. So Mises hit here in his an analysis of, um, uh, of socialism what philosophers would call a primitive of analysis. Right? It's something that we need to presuppose in, in our argument, but which we cannot explain in terms of more fundamental things. Right? It's, it's private property itself. Now, this sets him apart from the way private property has been dealt with all throughout the 20th century by standard economics, so neoclassical uh, microeconomics uh, in particular. Uh, the most important example that I can uh, give here uh, to illustrate this is, is the uh, approach that has been become uh, uh, famous uh, through um, uh, Ronald Coase, right, who received a Nobel Prize in 1991. So Ronald Coase, in, in Coase's thought, property always also plays a very important role. But he approaches the, the subject from a very different point of view. What Coase tries to do is to explain who should own what. So mathematically speaking, that means that private property, rather than being the independent variable, 
and we're not even talking about a primitive, becomes the dependent variable. And something else is more fundamental. And so what is more fundamental according to Coase? Well, it's utility. Okay. And so in that respect, there is no difference between Coase on the one hand and uh, whatever, all of uh, neoclassical welfare theory uh, on the other hand. Right? You always have the idea that social arrangements should be made in such a way, property rights should be dis distributed in such a way that social utility be maximized. Right? So property becomes a variable, dependent variable, of something that is more fundamental. And what Mises uh, uh, theory demonstrates is uh, that this conception is wrong-handed because we cannot even define value if we do not presuppose property. Right? The pro value is the relative importance of one choice alternative as compared to another. It's important that it's, it's, a, it's a choice alternative. So what can I choose about? Well, about things that I own, that I can control right, in the economic sense. I, uh, so value is not free-floating, right? There's no, utility doesn't exist in, in, in empty space. It uh, doesn't lead a separate existence from um, the concrete situation of an acting human being, but it's all, always embedded in a given um, availability of things that we control, of our, of our property. And only from that point of view, well, can we then meaningfully define what value is? That is, the attempt to just to um, uh, explain uh, to justify uh, property in terms of utility is from the outset uh, abortive because we cannot even define what these utilities are independent of the, uh, the property itself. So property, private property, is a primitive of economic reasoning. It's something that we cannot go beyond. So we might say, okay, that's very fine. So then how... Um, so how do we come to know about this? How do we deal scientifically? How do we deal analytically with the primitive? And here indeed, while well, economists can rely on, on, on philosophers, uh, let's say in particular, uh, uh, mention here Leibniz. Right? Well, Leibniz uh, has explained to us, well, the, the way we come to know about the uh, fundamental and a priori fundamental of our analysis is by uh, reflective discursive reasoning. If we have to presuppose something in, you know, in our argument in order to make the argument, then we have encountered something that is a primitive, that is fundamental uh, in this way. Right? For example, I cannot uh, argue that this, it's impossible to make uh, choices. I cannot argue this because advancing this argument, I must presuppose that the persons to whom I'm addressing myself are able to make a choice, namely, for example, to adopt my point of view. So it's from the outset contradictory to presuppose the, the opposite, so therefore I've hit here a, a primitive, a, fu a, fun a fundamental element. Right? Um, I cannot presuppose, I cannot argue that words have no meaning, right? because the argument would presuppose that my words do have meaning. Right? And in the uh, in the case of, um, uh, of private property, Hans Hermann Hoppe has delivered a Leibnizian uh, way of demonstrating that pre a private property needs to be presupposed because uh, by, by, by pointing out that whenever I make an argument, that is, I use my uh, voice, right, so my uh, uh, body to, to utter words and so on, I must presuppose that I legitimately may use uh, my tongue uh, and, and my voice and so on in order to make uh, this point. Right? I must presuppose that the other person to whom I'm addressing myself is the legit legitimate owner of his own property because I want him to change his own behavior. So I must presuppose that he owns something legitimately uh, that uh, requires that I address my, myself uh, to him, not just take whatever I, I think I, I should take. So in conclusion, because I think we uh, leave a, a few room for, uh, for questions, right? Um, this is just, uh, just one example that uh, I could have, of, of course, given uh, many others in particular. Uh, another area where Mises really stands on the Austrians in general is, is monetary theory, which I'll leave this out. Right? Uh, one 
important reason to become still interested in Austrian economics today and for which it is worthwhile for young researchers to base their um, inquiries on the grounds that have been established by Mises uh, is that it uh, provides an avenue for a realistic way of inquiring um, uh, about social relations, about uh, inquiring about human action, uh, which, which stands apart uh, from, from neoclassical economics. Now, this does not mean that I'd say, well, we should not question what uh, uh, Mises uh, comes up with, that we uh, should not criticize this, because Mises certainly, well, he was, I mean, like any scientific work, uh, this, is, this is imperfect, right? It's a, it's a step in, in, in time. Uh, but definitely, he has stronger arguments than what we receive from the other side. And the, the, uh, the perennity of, of, so of the f fruitfulness of, of Mises' approach is shown by the way that it's still there as an alternative to the way um, economic analysis is practiced in uh, the standard approach, which makes these assumptions, which are not based on observation, which are not based on empirical findings and so on, but which are, which are a priori that are brought to economic analysis, right? If you pre uh, presuppose that value is something completely different and separate from, from property, right, then uh, you make a fundamental assumption that is not based itself on observation or on analysis, right, but which colors uh, your result. And what Mises demonstrates us and what Hoppe has demonstrated is that it's the wrong assumption. Right? So the, the, the correct assumption is to see uh, value, respectively utility, as being inextricably bound up with, with property cannot be analytically uh, separated from this, right? uh, and so therefore needs to be analyzed in this context. And this then leads to the, uh, the, the statements that he has made about uh, uh, the culture of capitalism being a historically contingent, fragile, right? so deserving of support, uh, reality uh, that does not fall from the skies and uh, needs uh, people like those who are involved with the Polish Mises Institute and, and other uh, libertarian institutions in the world to be kept alive. Thank you for your attention.